dear friends welcome to this edition of vbs osteomed a series of video lectures in osteology or uh, posted on youtube the topic is called the treasure box where we discuss the interior of the cranial cavity we will take up the part 2 of this discussion namely the middle cranial floor earlier in part 1 we have completed the anterior cranial floor this is a slide we have borrowed from the previous video the dotted line blue white dotted line roughly demarcates the interior of the cranial cavity into an anterior middle and a posterior area or a zone this more or less corresponds to what we discussed in base of skull we could also call it as instead of anterior middle and posterior frontal the middle or sphenoparietal and posterior or occipital this is another way of calling it now shown in a, a highlighted blue and white uh, area a, a rectangular area we have enlarged that uh, area to see it in uh, finer detail and in a higher magnification now this is the middle cranial fossa and the middle cranial floor of this fossa let's try to identify as many structures as are possible now this has four identif four items to identify let's concentrate on the dotted circle that is the body of the sphenoid and in particular in this uh, discussion uh, the upper surface of the uh, body of the sphenoid which is nothing but the pituitary fossa hypophyseal fossa or the pituitary fossa that plate of bone separates the pituitary fossa from the sphenoidal air sinus below it next you can see yeah there are two flashing arrows the curved larger flashing arrow represents the lesser wing of the sphenoid we have covered it in the anterior cranial floor that posterior border of the lesser wing of the sphenoid demarcates the anterior from the middle cranial floor it's a reasonably sharp border <laughs> next there is another arrow a straight arrow which is the greater wing of the sphenoid in a later discussion between the lesser wing and the greater wing we will identify the superior orbital fissure let's come to the opposite side there is another curved arrow static arrow non flashing arrow that uh, arrow refers to the uh, squamous temporal uh, bone squamous part of the temporal bone that has been shown particularly because it is above and lateral to the greater wing of the sphenoid bone now i just mentioned in the previous uh, slide that between the lesser wing and the greater wing lies the superior orbital fissure that's the static arrow but on the other side there is a flashing arrow that uh, flashing arrow is nothing but the posterior extension of the uh, lesser wing called the anterior cranoid process anterior cranoid process now there are four items to identify let's first examine the flashing arrow there is only one flashing arrow here the curved flashing arrow that points to the posterior wall of the pituitary fossa which we will call it as dorsum cell dorsum cell the two upper lateral edges of this dorsum cell 
or the posterior clinoid process not very prominent in this particular specimen i will show you in some other specimens in due in the uh, later part of this discussion next on this side we have two arrows one is a horizontal arrow and another is an oblique arrow the both the arrows actually are pointing to the petrous part of the temporal bone but the lower value arrow in particular is referring to the upper border of the petrous temporal where the superior petrosal sinus is located next just like we identified the posterior wall of the uh, pituitary fossa and called it as the dorsum cellae likewise the anterior wall is called the cella tarsica next on either sides of the cella tarsica running uh, longitudinally from behind forwards is a, a shallow carotid sulcus which lodges the internal carotid artery then in the midline there is a solid mass of bone behind the dorsum cellae now that mass of bone is the basi occiput well it's it's a part of the basilar part of the occipital bone and little in front the posterior uh, wall of the body the particular slope that you see here is called the clivus next there are two foramina that can be identified uh, at this area close to the body greater vingosphenoid junction the curved one uh, is the larger curved arrow is the foramen rotundum through this the maxillary nerve uh, exits the middle cranial fossa and uh, reaches the pterygopalatine fossa then there is another arrow a straight vertical arrow which is pointing to a more or less an irregular slit in the uh, middle cranial fossa uh, it's immediately lateral to the base of occiput that's the foramen lacerum strictly speaking there is no major or very important structure passing through the foramen uh, lacerum so that's for undergraduates uh, but then postgraduates may be asked for very very minute details uh, uh, which do pass uh, through this foramen next close to the lacerum edge of the foramen lacerum is the anterior opening of the eustachian tube shown by uh, an uh, oblique down pointing arrow on the other side immediately lateral to the uh, foramen lacerum is a curved arrow a larger arrow which points to the foramen ovale the foramen ovale transmits the mandibular part of the trigeminal nerve to the infratemporal fossa likewise immediately posterior and lateral to the foramen ovale is the foramen spinosum this foramen transmits the middle meningeal artery from the infratemporal fossa into the middle cranial fossa now that's an important uh, these two are important structures both communicate with the infratemporal fossa next there is a suture there are three arrows pointing to the length of the suture it is a suture that connects the greater wing of the sphenoid with the uh, squamous part of the temporal bone with the squamous part of the temporal bone on the other side as already mentioned in the earlier part of the discussion the upper border of the petrous temporal hosts the superior petrosal uh, venous sinus next not very prominently seen in this specimen but i am going to show you in other specimens close to the apex of the petrous temporal right above the uh, foramen lacerum is an impression for the trigeminal ganglia and we'll call it the trigeminal impression not very prominent i told you but then just note the location similarly on a little more posterior plate that is more into the posterior cranial fossa there are two arrows pointing to the uh, suture between the basi occiput and the petrous part of the temporal bone i have called it occipital temporal suture but you can also call it as uh, petro occipital suture 
Next. <coughs> In the anterior wall of the petrous temporal is also the posterior boundary of the middle meaning of the middle cranial fossa. This sloping wall has a, uh, some hiatuses and some grooves. By and large, I have called them as a, uh, collectively called them as hiatus and groove for the petrosal nerves. Petrosal nerves. On the opposite side, I have labeled uh, a, a circled area, a dotted circle. It's a slight elevation noticed on the um, wall that is the anterior wall of the petrous temporal bone. It corresponds to the superior semicircular canal. This elevation is right above the superior semicircular canal. Now this is from a another skull. Uh, this photograph is superior view. Only, only point to notice lower down here is the uh, anterior cranial fossa. The posterior cranial fossa is, is above and to the right and exactly shown by the dotted circle is the trigeminal impression. Is the trigeminal impression very well seen here. And the, similarly, the arcuate eminence is also well were marked in this particular uh, specimen. Yet another specimen. At the upper end of this photograph is the crystagalite, so that should be the anterior cranial fossa. At the lower end is the posterior cranial fossa. The labeling is restricted to the middle cranial fossa. You can see the petrosal grooves, petrosal grooves running obliquely downwards and forwards, uh, somewhere towards the foramen laceram. You can also see right above these grooves the prominent, in fact, in this specimen, it is the best seen, the trigeminal impression, which lodges the uh, trigeminal ganglion, sensory ganglion of the trigeminal nerve. Yet another photograph where the focus is again on the middle cranial fossa. The anterior cranial fossa is in front, posterior is behind. Particularly, you note that the dorsum cell is extremely prominent in this case. So, so it casts a shadow and really, really deepens the pituitary fossa. Now, that's the dorsum cell. And the actually, the semicircular canal, superior semicircular canal has been dissected out and that elevation that you can see corresponding to its location. Next, the same photograph which you just saw in the previous slide, I have zoomed in onto the central region where the uh, pituitary fossa, in the vicinity of the pituitary fossa, you can see how prominent both the anterior and the posterior clinoid processes are. In fact, there is a 1 mm gap between the two. There is a 1 mm gap between the two. Sometimes it can be as prominent as this. Next, we mentioned earlier that the superior orbital fissure is immediately below the lesser wing of the sphenoid. From a top view, the edge of the lesser wing itself may block the uh, visibility of the superior orbital fissure. So, I have taken a slightly angular shot, more from a posterolateral angle I have shot. And you can see the uh, black area, that's the superior orbital fissure. Further below it is the foramen rotundum, which I have discussed earlier and mentioned that the maxillary nerve reaches the uh, sphenopalatine sphere, sorry, the sphenopalatine <coughs> fossa reaches the pterygopalatine fossa. Now you see. The superior orbital fissure, a little more detail, already mentioned, upper border, lesser wing, lower border, greater wing, medial border, the body of the sphenoid bone. This is only a list. Structures are not seen in a dry skull, but there is a number of structures which pass from or which both directions, from the middle cranial fossa to the orbit and
vice versa depending upon the structure the third fourth and the sixth cranial nerve and of the fifth cranial nerve the lacrimal frontal and the nasociliary branches ophthalmic veins and sympathetic plexus to name a few these are all important structures that pass from the uh, middle cranial fossa into the orbit or vice versa as for example the veins it, it can pass in either directions next this is a sagittal section of the skull the body of the sphenoid is well seen the sphenoid layer sinus is a huge cavity and its roof is the floor of the pituitary fossa is the roof is the floor of the pituitary fossa that can be very well seen right below is the sphenoid layer sinus As I showed you in the previous uh, photograph, here also the anterior and the posterior cranoid processes are extremely prominent. I just showed that. Now, this is a very interesting observation. It's obvious that the pituitary fossa is quite deep seated and poses challenges regarding surgical access. But keeping in mind that uh, the brain is there above it on either sides of it, I mean the temporal lobes. It's difficult to access the pituitary fossa from above or from the side. But it is, there is a possibility that using the transnasal or transoral approach, we can go through the sphenoid bone, sphenoid sinus and then reach the pituitary uh, fossa. In other words, we will remove the roof of the sphenoid layer sinus and we can reach the pituitary fossa. This is useful for operating on tumors of the pituitary gland. This is another slide where the very prominent anterior and the posterior clinoid processes are seen in this sagittal section. Incidentally, since it is a sagittal section, a little in front in the anterior cranial fossa, just an incidental labeling, the crusta gala is very well seen. Just like the trigeminal impression I showed you in the base of, in the floor of the middle cranial fossa, here also you can see a, a pit, a shadow pit for the, that's the trigeminal impression. The whole bone immediately behind it is the pitrous part of the temporal bone. Next, we, on, we move on to, uh, from the bone, the dry bone, Let's look at an actual specimen where we have removed the calvarium and uh, the brain has been removed and we are now looking at uh, um, the floor of the uh, cranial fossae with the dural carpet still intact. You can see in one corner a flap of dura has been folded and kept aside. Now the dotted circle once again refers to the or points to the pituitary fossa. In particular, you see, since it is not a dry skull, this is an actual specimen from which the brain has been removed. You can see the oculomotor nerve and the trigeminal nerve. The flashing arrow is the trigeminal nerve and the other arrow, static arrow, is the oculomotor nerve. It is very well seen in this specimen. Also seen in this specimen, that is, uh, it's a wet specimen, you can see the dorsum cell, that is the posterior wall of the fossa, and it's an upper lateral extension, the posterior clinoid process. The prominent lesser wing of the sphenoid covered by a cloth of dura is seen. The cavernous sinus is located on either side, the bent arrow uh, refers to the cavernous sinus. It's there on either sides of the pituitary fossa, right and the left coronary sinus. At the upper lateral edge of the pituitary fossa, there is a prominent fold, which is nothing but a dural fold, which is nothing but the cut edge of the tentorium cerebelli. The, the tentorium has been cut in this specimen to remove the brain. So hence I have written tentorium cerebelli, cerebelli, the cut edge of it. 
So in this specimen, we can identify lesser wing of the sphenoid, the cavernous sinus, and the cut edge of the tentorium cerebellum. We have finished the wet specimen. Now, to the extent possible, let's try to understand some amount of appreciation of uh, uh, the radiological uh, anatomy, particularly CT, MRI, etc. We, we, at least some major uh, items or structures we should be able to identify. Here is an MRI skull base. You can see there are uh, the two orbital cavities very prominently seen. You can, you can see the uh, orbits, the eyeballs, and in black you can see the optic nerve. That that shows the area on either side. That is the uh, orbital cavity. But then more towards the apex of the orbital cavity, you can see the jugum sphenoidal, a part of the um, the central part uh, of the body of the sphenoid. You can also see further behind the pituitary fossa, the outline of the pituitary fossa. Details we discussed a little earlier. You can also see the posterior border of the lesser wing of the sphenoid. The sharp edge casts a white shadow with this uh, photograph. Next, I, I told you the optic nerve in the previous slide. You can see it as a, a static horizontal arrow. Marked by a curved arrow on the other side is the interpeduncular fossa. This is in the right in the midline uh, above the that basically that that area is the interpeduncular fossa you can see the two peduncles on either sides and uh, the bone immediately uh, adjacent that is uh, sloping down is the clivus yet another mri skull base the orbital cavities the nasal cavity the nasal septum the lateral nasal wall, these are reasonably well seen. Particularly posterior to the uh, nasal cavity is seen the pterygoid plates, medial and lateral pterygoid plates. They, the two plates are directed posteriorly and the space in between is the pterygoid fossa. Further behind, the basi occiput can be seen uh, forming the anterior margin of the foramen magnum. Next, the carotid canal can be seen roughly in the middle of the pitrous part of the temporal bone. Also seen are, on this side I have put two curved arrows. The upper curved arrow is the condyle of the temporomandibular joint and the lower curved arrow is the external auditory meatus. See, it is black in color. On the other side, there are two arrows. The one, the anterior or the upper arrow is horizontal and points exactly at the pterygo maxillary fissure. Remember, the fissure is quite a... Uh, uh, long fissure. So, if the section goes through this, the fissure is generally well seen. In front of the fissure is the posterior wall of the maxilla. I repeat, posterior wall of the maxilla, not the orbit, posterior maxillary wall. And the other arrow, obliquely down, pointing down, refers to uh, a mastoid air cells. Next. This is a coronal section MRI, roughly at the uh, level of the pituitary, a plane of the pituitary. You can see the pituitary tract and the optic tracts on either side, that central dotted circle, that area. On either side, you can see the cavernous sinus. And immediately below the pituitary fossa is the sphenoidal air cells. Dear friends, that was an overview of uh, the middle cranial. Fossa. I'm sure you will have some points for feedback. Uh, I would be happy to receive it. This is my email ID. Feel free to write it. Or better still, you can even uh, write up the 
feedback on the blog area immediately below the um, YouTube video. That was a presentation from the Department of Anatomy, St. John's Medical College. And I am Dr. Balasubramanyam, who is presenting this uh, video. Also available on YouTube is another series of uh, videos called VBS Histobet. It's a series of uh, histology videos, about 90 plus videos. Please remember to subscribe it and also press the bell button so that you will be notified as in when additional uh, videos are added to this collection. Thank you for your patient uh, listening and viewing of this uh, video.